Terry and he <laughs> crack me up too. <laughs> hey everybody, what's going on? What's hot? What's hip? What's happening? What's shaking on your Friday? Gosh, I love these Friday shows. Can't get enough of them. I wish there was two of them every week. I tell you, it's it really great. Hey, tonight we're going to talk about Altamont, which was uh, a concert that attracted quite a bit of controversy and rightfully so. But until then, you know, like, share, subscribe, retweet, uh, whatever, you know, notification, all that stuff. You guys know what it is. I've also uh, put how you can turn on gifted memberships in the crawl at the bottom of the screen. If there are people that want to try and do that, then they can go ahead and do that. That'd be wonderful. And uh, other ways and super chat and blah, 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 you know. Uh, there is a fabulous episode of Replayables coming on at uh, 8 Eastern, I believe. So we'll be out at top of the hour, as usual. And uh, let me see here. Come on now. Don't, don't do me like that. SG Playboy uh, Fanboy says, very early, very hetero. <laughs> I don't know which. I <laughs> Yes and yes. Um, I suppose would be the answer to that. Uh, was there something I was going to discuss at the top of this whole thing? I don't think, I mean, there was, but I can't remember what it is now. Um, but we are going to talk about Altamont and, um, you know, um, then I'll go to bed because I got to get up and be on the big fancy radio station at five in the morning. Hmm. And I know there's hundreds and thousands of people waiting for that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, OJ, we did that yesterday. And uh, it's convinced me that we need, to de re we need to revisit the whole trial. There's a lot of stuff about that trial that is kind of fell by the wayside and we will be doing that at some point we're going to do that assassination of uh, james abram garfield we are going to cover the superstars and we are going to do a show on jim brown and then we will do a show for uh, my friend the late great jay johnson whose birthday uh was either yesterday or today sadly that's not the date that i remember it's just the date of his passing but uh, we will do a show on the late, great Jay Johnson. He's just an amazing, amazingly talented man. Uh, Sunday Jenna says, oh, hey, Tom Gully. Oh, hey, Sunday Jenna. Thank Joe for sending me that gifted membership link, uh, which, which, believe it or not, I would have found. But uh, because he did it, uh, I trust it more, and I didn't have to find it. So uh, Sunday Jenna says, thank you for the gifted membership. I didn't do that but somebody else did that and i'm sure they appreciate your thanks and if they know they've given sunday jenna of all people a gifted membership then uh they'll be very happy and here is producer joe's uh mug that's his actual mug right there yes well actually it's a picture of his mug but you know what i mean and uh, so that's a famous one hopefully that's 20 ouncer and here's the thing I tried to put on the screen last night, which was somebody AI'd, uh, <laughs> somebody, somebody AI'd me as a flock, the flock of seagulls guy, which I think is hilarious. Yeah, and, and I may go to that hairstyle. It can't be any worse than the one that I currently have. Yes, these gifted memberships are all fake. I'm getting them from Argentina. Can't wait. Stuttering John doesn't know who I am and there's no need to take notice of me. I don't talk about him that much, but I can just, oh, he's got a fake one. Uh, we watched last night's on replay. Well, I'll thank you for watching it on replay. I don't, I, you know, watch it when you want. Integrate it into your lifestyle. I ask no more than that. Uh, any more would be too much. Any less would be too little. Uh, SG Fanboy, big smile there. And uh, yes, it's they're all fake. They're all fake. They're completely fake. Oh, behind me this evening, of course, is Mick Jagger, hand to mouth, aghast at the Hells Angels, who are working security 
kind of, maybe, we don't know for sure. It's quite a controversy. But we will get into everything that happened at Altamont, which, strangely enough, well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to start doing it now. I'm not going to. I'll do it when I do it, and then not until I do it. I'll do the. You know, when I do, when I do it, not until I do it. I'll, I'll do. You know, I'm going to do the thing I did when I do the thing that I do. Yes, if things were different, they wouldn't be the same. You know what? If you really want to make somebody mad. <laughs> particularly a superior that you don't like very much in a business setting, say that. Well, if you would have done this and that and this and that, we could have done this and that and the other thing and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, if things were different, they wouldn't be the same, would they? Doesn't earn you a lot of bonus points with your superior. <laughs> True, though it may be. Okay, it's five after. And uh, we got to be out of here at the top of the hour for my good friends on Replayables. So I guess I better open my thing. Uh, there's one thing I love more than anything. It's opening my thing. Yes. So Altamont is uh, actually the official title of Altamont was the Altamont Free Concert. I'm just going to go ahead and put the Rolling Stones up here because... They were a big part of Altamont. Now, there's two narratives to Altamont. And just for those of you who don't know, Altamont was like supposed to be the West Coast Woodstock. Okay, that's why it was a free concert, right? And uh, love and flower power and good times and all of that stuff. Well, what ended up happening was extremely bad. And so... Here we go. <clears throat> There's two narratives to this. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you that the concert featured Santana, Jefferson Airplane, the Flying Burrito Brothers, who were much bigger back then than you can imagine, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, with the Rolling Stones being the final act. Now, there's two narratives to this whole thing. One of them is what Jefferson Airplane people say, and the other is what the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead say. So this idea to have this kind of a Woodstock West started, according to Jefferson Airplane, when two members of the group, Spencer Dryden and Jorma Kakonen, discussed the idea of staging a free concert with the Grateful Dead and the Rolling Stones in Golden Gate Park. And, you know, next to the Beatles, they were the biggest rock band in the world. And they wanted the Rolling Stones to have that San Francisco experience that the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane had, right? So as these plans were being finalized, Jefferson Airplane was on the road. And they thought the whole thing for Golden Gate Park was locked up. But toward the end of that year, um, which was, of course, 1969, plans kind of broke down. And they were going to, you know, have it. And then the police and the hippies and Haight Ashbury got into a big brouhaha. And then they said, let's do it at Sonoma Raceway. But the owners of Sonoma Raceway wanted $100,000 in escrow from the Rolling Stones. So that was like, forget it. So at the last moment, this guy named Dick Carter said, look, I've got a speedway. It's called Altamont Speedway. It's in Alameda County, and you can hold it here. So basically, Jefferson Airplane flew in, and they took this location out of pure desperation. And they were, they were like, there's no control over this event. There's no supervision. And Grace Slick, the famous lead singer of uh, Jefferson Airplane most of the time, said the vibes were bad. Something was very peculiar, not particularly bad, just peculiar. And it was that kind of hazy, abrasive, unsure day. She said, I had expected the loving vibes of Woodstock, but that wasn't coming at me. This was a whole different thing. And boy, was she right. Now, the Rolling Stones and Grateful Dead say that 
During the Rolling Stones' 1969 U.S. tour, many people, journalists, fans, other rock bands, felt that the ticket prices were too high. And so, in response to that, the Rolling Stones said, let's end our tour with a free concert in San Francisco, which was the epicenter of the hippie, flower power, free love movement. It was originally, according to the Rolling Stones, Grateful Dead supposed to be held at San Jose University's practice field. But another problem occurred with securing money for all that. And then they wanted it at Golden Gate Park. But there was a Chicago Bears, San Francisco 49ers football game in Kazar Stadium, which was in Golden Gate Park. And it's like, no, that's not going to happen. And then the permits were refused to be issued for that concert anyway. So then they were going to do it at Sears Point Raceway near Sonoma. But then the dispute with Sears Point's owner, which was Filmways Incorporated, uh, that was like a big television and movie production company, and they wanted $300,000 upfront cash from the Rolling Stones and film distribution rights. And the Rolling Stones, forget it. So... Once again, Dick Carter comes in and says, hold it here, Altamont. Now, in making pre preparation for the whole thing, the Grateful Dead's manager, Ron Rock Scully, and the concert organizer, Michael Land, helicoptered over the site uh, before making this selection, just like Lang had done when the Woodstock Festival was going on. And this hasty move to Altamont Man, it just had problems attached to it from the start. Lack of facilities like portable toilets and medical tents. Uh, stage design. Instead of being at the top of a rise, okay, it would now be at the bottom of a slope. And so the stage was like 39 inches off of the ground, okay? Which, if you're a big famous rock man like the Rolling Stones back then... You want a, a nice four or five feet above uh, the stage, minimum. There was no scaffolding. There was nothing. So because the stage was so low, and this is huge, members of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club were asked to surround the stage to supply security. And it's going to be real obvious why this is a huge thing shortly because the Hells Angels were intimately involved with what is probably, arguably, one of the most violent and disturbing things that's ever happened at a rock concert. Uh, by some people's accounts, the Hells Angels were hired as security by the Rolling Stones because the Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane had used them as security before without incident. And the payment for this to the Hells Angels was $500 in beer. This has been disputed by lots of people. Um, they were only supposed to make sure that nobody tampered with the generators that were supplying the power to the stage, according to the Rolling Stones road manager. They weren't supposed to be the police force, uh, but a deal was made. Uh, you know, the Hells Angels head guy recalled that his interaction with the manager of the Rolling Stones tour was like, we don't do police things. We're not a security force. We go to concerts to enjoy ourselves and have fun, to which the road manager said, well, what are you about helping people out? You know, giving directions and things. Sure, we can do that. <laughs> when the road manager asked how they'd like to be paid, <clears throat> the head of the Hells Angels said, we like beer. So, and in the documentary, the Stones documentary, Give, Give Me Shelter, the head Hells Angels guy said, we're not interested in policing. You know, the, they told us all we had to do is sit on the edge of the stage, drink beer, and make sure that nothing bad happened. So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> a lot of people give the story that the Hells Angels were hired and paid with $500 worth of beer. Um, but the head of the Hells Angels said, I ain't no cop. I ain't never going to pretend to be no cop. 
I didn't go there to do no police thing, man. They told me I could sit on the edge of the stage and nobody could climb over me. I could drink beer till the show was over. And that's what I went there to do. So <clears throat> after the whole thing went down, a woman called into a radio station and said she'd seen at least five fist fights from her vantage point near the stage. And the Hells Angels were involved in all of them. She also described a general uncaring attitude toward people who clearly needed help. A girl was dragged across the stage by her hair. Another who was on a bad acid trip uh, was kicked and walked on. Uh, and she felt the angels' security was a bad move. And I think it's pretty universally recognized that it's a bad move. And this concert went from not that great to begin with in terms of atmosphere and vibes to deteriorating rapidly. Now, the first act that came up was Santana, and that is a vintage era photo of the band Santana. It's two years after this concert, so it's pretty accurate. The first band, as I mentioned, Santana, gave a performance that generally went very smoothly. Uh, However, <laughs> over the course of the day, because remember, these are the featured acts. Other acts had been on throughout the day. The mood of the crowd and the Hell's Angels became more and more violent and agitated. The Angels had been drinking their free beer all day in front of the stage, and most of them were very drunk. The crowd had also become antagonistic and unpredictable, attacking each other, attacking the Hells Angels and the performers. A biographer for Mick Jagger, Anthony Scaduto, in his book, wrote, the only time the crowd seemed to calm down to any degree was during a set by the country-rocking Flying Burrito Brothers. And you gotta love the Flying Bur If you haven't checked out any of the Flying Burrito Brothers, you really need to. They're, they're, a, they're a heck of a group. They really are. They're, they're a heck of a group. So one of the bands that had promoted earlier, uh, performed earlier, excuse me, Denise Jukes of the local San Francisco rock band Ace of Cups, she was six months pregnant and she was hit in the head by an empty beer bottle thrown from the crowd and suffered a skull fracture. The Stones later paid for her ambulance and medical services. And the angels, the Hell's Angels, proceeded to arm themselves with sawed-off pool cues and motorcycle chains to drive the crowd further back from the stage. Now, after the crowd, most people say accidentally knocked over one of the Hells Angels motorcycles, the Angels became even more aggressive, including toward the performers. Marty Ballin, uh, who also sometimes was a lead singer for Jefferson Airplane, he jumped off the stage to try to sort out the problem, only to be punched in the head and knocked unconscious by one of the Hells Angels during their set, during the Jefferson Airplane set. And when Jefferson Airplane guitarist Paul Kantner sarcastically thanked the Angels for knocking the singer out, uh, one of the Hells Angels took a hold of the microphone and argued with him about it. The Grateful Dead had been scheduled to play in between Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Let me get those guys on screen for you. And Young. Yes, and Young. Uh... They were supposed to play in between CSNY and the Rolling Stones. But after hearing what happened to Marty Ballin of Jefferson Airplane uh, from the drummer of Santana, they refused to play and left. Left, said, hey, the security is deteriorating and we don't want to be part of this. During the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young set, Stephen Stills was reportedly repeatedly stabbed in the leg by a stoned out Hell's Angel who had used a sharpened bicycle spoke. By the time the Rolling Stones took the stage in the early evening, the mood was only could be described as ugly. Okay, numerous fights has, have erupted all over the crowd, within the crowd. It, it's just becoming an unsightly brawl. The Rolling Stones decided to wait until sundown 
to perform. And part of that delay was because Bill Wyman, one of the Stones, uh, missed the helicopter ride to the venue. So when the Stones began their set, a tightly packed group of about four or 5,000 people were jammed to the very edge of the stage and a lot of people are trying to climb onto the stage. And this is where things get even worse. Even worse if such a thing is possible. By the way, that, that is um, Jefferson Airplane of, of the time. There's Grace Slick there in the back. I can't tell which one's Marty Ballin because I only know him as his older self. So um, I'll just leave them up here for no other reason than I, I don't really have any pictures of the violence, nor would I show them probably if I did have them. Mick Jagger. And incidentally, th this can't be repeated enough. Um, in case you didn't know, and you should know already, I've got the moves like Jagger, very well documented. Uh, Mick Jagger had already been punched in the head by a concert goer within seconds of getting out of his helicopter. So he lands his helicopter, steps off of it, boom, punched in the head. And he was, as you can see in the picture behind me, he was visibly intimidated by the situation and he urged everyone to, uh, just be cool down there in front there. Don't push around. During the third song, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and fame. Sympathy for the devil. A fight erupted in the front of the crowd at the foot of the stage, prompting the Rolling Stones to pause their set while the Hells Angels restored order. After a lengthy pause and another appeal for calming things down, chill out, maintain, dude. Uh, the band restarted the song and continued their set with really less incidents until the start of Under My Thumb, it's girl, who would... Anyway, uh, when that song began, some of the Hell's Angels got into a scuffle with uh, a young man by the name of Meredith Hunter, who was only 18 years old. And that's when he attempted to get on stage with other fans. A bunch of the fans wanted to get on the stage. Now, something tells me if this had happened at Woodstock, the bands would have just sort of played along with them until they were quietly ushered off. Not, 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 not this time. One of the Hells Angels grabbed Hunter's head punched him and chased him back into the crowd. After a minute's pause, one uh, hunter returned to the stage where, according to the producer of the documentary, Gimme Shelter, Hunter's girlfriend, Patty Bredehoft, found him and tearfully begged him to calm down and move back into the crowd with her. But he was reportedly just enraged at the way he had been treated and he was irrational and, importantly, so high he could barely walk, according to her. Uh, the uh, members, one of the members anyway, of the Rolling Stones um, group, who could clearly see the audience from <clears throat> the top of a truck by the stage, said that I saw what he was looking This is he's talking about uh, Meredith Hunter. I saw what he was looking at, that he was crazy, he was on drugs, and he had murderous intent. There was no doubt in my mind he intended to do terrible harm to Mick or somebody in the Rolling Stones or somebody on that stage. Now, following his initial scuffle with the Hells Angels as he tried to climb on the stage, and you can see this in the concert footage. It's not like we don't know what happened. He returned to the crowd in front of of the stage and he drew out a long barreled 22 caliber revolver from inside of his jacket one of the hell's angels alan passaro seeing him draw the revolver drew a knife from his belt and charged him from the side parrying the pistol with his left hand and stabbing him twice with his right hand killing him Footage that was shot by a cameraman who was on stage 
taking film of the crowd appears in the documentary. And the guy who shot the film, Eric Saarinen, was completely unaware that he caught this killing on film. It was only discovered a week later when the raw footage was being screened. In the film sequence, which only lasts two seconds, a two meter opening in the crowd appears, leaving Meredith Hunter's girlfriend, Patty Bredehoff, in the center. Hunter appears from the left, his hand rises toward the stage. You can see the silhouette of the revolver. Uh, and Pissarro, the Hell's Angel, enters from the right and delivers those two stabs with his knife as he grabs or sort of parries the revolver, pushes him off screen, and then the opening that had been there for just a second closes around Patty Bredehoff. Pissarro was reported to have stabbed Hunter five times in the upper back, although only, only two of the stabs are vis visible in the footage. Witnesses also reported that Hunter was stomped on by several Hells Angels while he was on the ground. The gun was recovered. It was turned over to the police. Hunter's autopsy confirmed he was high on methamphetamine when he died. Pissarro was arrested and tried for murder in the summer of 1971, but was acquitted after the jury viewed the concert footage showing that Hunter had the revolver. And uh, the Rolling Stones were aware of the skirmish, but not the stabbing, okay? It soon became apparent, though, that you, they could see what had happened because the band stopped playing mid-song, and Jagger was heard calling into his microphone, we've got someone really hurt here. Is there a doctor? After a few minutes, the band began playing again and eventually completed their set. And uh, that's because Jagger and the band agreed if they quit playing at that time, the crowd would just be even more unruly, maybe resulting in a full-scale riot. <sighs> so I should mention a couple of other... Th that, that's not the only death that occurred at Altamont. Uh, there were two deaths from a hit-and-run car accident and one from an LSD-induced drowning in an irrigation canal. A, a whole bunch of people, scores of people were injured. Numerous cars were stolen and then abandoned. And there was major, major property damage. Um, the Altamont concert is frequently contrasted with Woodstock, which took place only four months earlier. Because while Woodstock represented peace and love, Altamont came to be viewed as the end of the hippie era. A lot of people also consider the uh, Tate LaBianca murders the end of that era, but who cares? It's, the era ended. Um, it was a symbol for the death of the Woodstock sort of ethos, that, that kind of uh, you know philosophy. Um, writers focus on that people that are historians focus on that like crazy and uh the rolling stone magazine named after of course you know um they did a 14 page 11 article 11 author article on the event and the title of the, the article was the rolling stones disaster at altamont let it bleed and uh, it says Altamont was the product of diabolical egoism, hype, ineptitude, money manipulation, and a fundamental lack of concern for humanity. The film, Gimme Shelter, that had you know, elements of this particular concert in it, that's not the only thing it's in that documentary, but it was uh, criticized by Two of the biggest, and one of them is one of the biggest film critics in history, Pauline Kael, and Vincent Canby, and others, for portraying the Rolling Stones too sympathetically. And uh, they staged the concert, according to these people, because it could be filmed, despite all the problems. They wanted that film. They wanted that you know, performance as part of their documentary. 
Rolling Stones' Keith Richards uh, says it was basically well handled, but lots of people were tired and a few tempers got frayed. On the whole, a good concert. If that's not a Keith Richards oblivious statement, I have never heard one in my life. The Grateful Dead wrote several songs about or in response to what uh, happened at Altamont, including New Speedway Boogie and Mason's Children, uh, and they put that on their early 1970 album, Working Man's Dead. It also inspired the Blue, Co- Blue Oyster Cult song, uh, Transmaniacon MC, MC meeting Motorcycle Club. Uh, the incidents mentioned in The Cable Guy, uh, there's other rock groups have mentioned it. Altamont is also referenced by Don McLean in American Pie. In the song's fifth verse, the majority of that verse contains symbols related to Altamont. Jack Flash, a reference to San Francisco. Candlestick, because <clears throat> Candlestick Park is a famous San Francisco icon. Uh, sympathy for the Devil, an enraged spectator watching something on a stage, and an angel born in hell, hell's angels. Uh, McLean officially refused to confirm or deny the song's ties to Altamont until he sold his songwriting notes in 2015. And within the context of the song, Altamont served as the culmination of the period that began with the death of Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and Big Bopper in 1959. So uh, anyway, in, in 2008, a former FBI agent asserted that some members of the Hells Angels had conspired to murder Mick Jagger in retribution for the Stones' lack of support following the concert and for the negative betrayal of the Hells Angels in the Gimme Shelter film. And these guys were asking, they were using a boat and approaching various residents asking where Jagger was staying on Long Island, and the plot failed when the boat was nearly sunk by a storm. So that's probably appropriate. Um... January 2022, the Library of Congress shared a 30-minute clip of soundless footage shot from the stage at Altamont, uh, and they got those pieces of footage from the Preminger um, archives. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Altamont. There's a lot more. There's a lot more detail. You could go into it. I have the entire set list here from all of the acts. Um, Flying Burrito Brothers did six days on the road and I'm going to make it home tonight. Um, CSNY didn't do any of their biggest hits. The Rolling Stones, this is actually a a killer, uh, it's a killer set list. Um, Jumpin' Jack Flash, Carol, Sympathy for the Devil, Stray Cat Blues, Love in Vain, Under My Thumb, Brown Sugar, uh, Live With Me, um, a naked woman tried to climb onto the stage during this song, by the way. Gimme Shelter, Little Queenie, I Can't Get No sta- Satisfaction, Honky Tonk Woman, and then it's just probably in, an, in a spectacular uh, show of uh, poor song choice to end it with, Street Fighting Man. So there you go. I do suggest that you do see Gimme Shelter, the 1970 uh, film. Uh, And it chronicles the last weeks of the Stones' 1969 U.S. tour and culminates with Altamont. So there you go. uh, it It is actually a documentary worth seeing. So with all that in mind, that, ladies and gentlemen, is my best version of what happened at Altamont. So there you are. What's a, what's a, I, I don't think I need any more pictures up here. I can just start going through these, through these chats. Um, and yes, I do have the moves like Jagger. I would just, I can't stress that enough. Let me see here. Um, Terry Nee says, love? Gross. I'm so sure. Eddie Mac says, Tim live. Yeah, baby. Eddie Mac calls me Tim, and I think it's hilarious. Um, PLV says, I am what I am, and that's all I am. Well, PLV, nobody's wanting you to be more. We like you just the way you are. Eddie Mac says, Jane. 
I don't know what that means. Toby McGroby says, who do you complain to? The Hells Angels. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got any complaints? Yeah, well, direct them to the gentleman over there in the uh, biker's cut. What a team player. Yeah. Was Graham Parsons in the Flying Burrito Brothers? Something tells me that he was. Something tells me that he was. Well, I think he did a song called Flying Burrito Number Two. Uh, I mean, I'm going to check that out for you real quickly. Notice how I'm not using my computer so that uh, StreamYard doesn't hose me. Um, Parsons. I think he was in the Flying Burrito Brothers. Uh, Ingram Cecil Connor the third. Yes, he was in the Flying Burrito Brothers. He's got a famous song called Hot Burrito Number One that I like quite a bit. I'm your toy. I'm your old boy. Uh, Sympathy for the Devil is my favorite song, says Terry Nee. Terry Nee, that, that's... Yeah, you are a man of wealth and taste. You've been around for a thousand years. Uh, can't you hear me knocking you out? <laughs> that's awful, but funny. Uh, Lyndon said, never saw a single act of violence at Woodstock, except the call for watching out for the brown acid. That's the part of that, that documentary that freaks me out the most. To stay away from the brown acid. If you said that at a concert now, you'd be arrested. I had no idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, yo, Tom and my fellow gully heads. Hey, yo, Doc Torn. Uh, the second Woodstock was terrible and violent. That was a mess, too. It was a big mess. Also, hello, everyone. Had to work late. Don't worry about it, Aku. Just don't fall, please. Those hippies are our senators now. And, and the world's a better place for it, really. Don't trust anyone over 30. You know what I'm saying? By the way, phone lines are open at 972-994-6822. Uh, Doctrine said Odin's beard, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was really wild. They were. They were. I was there for all of them. Well, I missed a couple years of the 60s. Um, welcome back, Aku. What year was the last Woodstock? Don't know. I don't pay attention to them. Because it's like you could never recreate that again. And they were just, I don't know. It's, you know, the people at Live Aid didn't say, let's do Woodstock again. They said, no, let's have Live Aid. Let's do our own thing. And so I, I don't pay attention to it. Um Randy Ramos says, busy night, just got here. Well, it's Friday night down in Union Station, brother. You're going to be cooking up some pizzas. Uh, Gilman says, were the Hell's Angels into meth? I'm quite certain the Hell's Angels were taking anything that could be taken at some point, not necessarily at the concert, but the Hell's Angels were not known to uh, turn down a stimulant or depressant. Mm. Hmm. Doc Dorn says, very much into meth. I'm, I'm sure they were. I wasn't there. I can't say for sure, but they, they may have been. Uh, the, the Kahuna has gifted a Tom Gully Show membership. Those of you who have not turned on your gifted memberships, uh, you can see how to do that here in the crawl. You just go to youtube.com slash at Tom Gully Show slash allow underscore gifts. And do what it says there. Do what it says. Uh, Hell's Angels War Against the Mongols MC is pretty interesting. I know somebody that had major interactions uh, with the head of the Mongols at one point. Uh, people saying hi. Um, Aku says, I will not be restrained by the laws of gravity. <laughs> Aku says, I ask about Woodstock as Cousin Ed, Philly Jock, and he talked about emceeing the event. Apparently there were fires, but he just kept the party going. Yes. Hey, the big kahuna. The big kahuna gifted a membership. I don't know if anybody got it. I can't see. I'm on StreamYard. I'm not on, uh, not on the other one, uh, YouTube right now. I'm just... Uh, who do we got here? Oh, by the way, uh, YouTube is the preferred way to watch the Tom Gully Show. Now, we have 17 incredible people watching it on X, formerly known as Twitter. 
right now and we love you for it and if you want to watch it there i'm not going to tell you any different but the preferred way is on youtube because that's how we get all of our views and watch hours and all that stuff so you know and i can't chat with you personally in the chat room nor can anyone else um on twitter now i think you can chat toward me or something maybe i don't know i but i've never gotten a twitter chat here so i think that portion of it uh, doesn't let us do that it just allows us to stream to twitter basically so um linden says lsd got some of the bikers big time at that show yeah i would imagine i would imagine so it's uh it's an event, and look at Mick here. You kind of have to, Mick's watching the Hells Angels just do, and he's like, my word. The punk rockers would not have been quite so, uh, you know. The punk rockers were playing at maximum security prisons, and they had plenty of fights and bleeding, and, you know, well, you know, Sid Vicious carved, I need a fix, into his chest. That was here in Dallas, I think. with a broken beer bottle nonetheless with a broken beer bottle that's the way things went back when back when so anyway that ladies and gentlemen is the story as best as i can tell it to you of altamont so uh you know there you go there you go Concerts ain't all sunshines and roses. It's a very mean and nasty place, and it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. But it ain't about how much you can hit, how hard you can hit. It's about how much you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Anyway, sorry, just went on it rocky diatribe there you know i do that sometimes even even though and I, and I think it bears repeating again i do have the moves like jagger very very well documented not not the moves like jagger here on screen but but a certain amount of moves like jagger really i i possess that so uh gilman says did lsd in college wouldn't touch it now yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. But but back then, lysodisergic acid was very experimentally used by a lot of people in a lot of different forms. Thank you, Dr. Timothy Leary. Uh, and scene. Um, but that wasn't good for people. I mean, most of the Manson family was just tripping acid. I mean, when they asked... Uh, Leslie Van Houten, was it her? Patricia Krangwinkel, how many how many hits of acid they've they had? They were like hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand. And that's too many. That's gonna affect your brain chemistry just a little bit. Aku said, I sadly haven't seen Rocky, and I can't watch it now as I don't want to think of it as a bad movie. Well, the original Rocky is is, is quite a piece of cinema it is a serious film and it's a wonderful film as it went on in the series it got a little hyped up and but i'm a sucker for a rocky movie i watch them all i love them all except for number five which just please and then the last one rocky balboa redeems the whole series and it is a wonderful film it, it uh, it's just they're wonderful films um, Hendrix did acid. Oh, all those dudes did acid. I'm, I'm sure uh, Janice did acid. Tune in. No, turn on, tune in, drop out. Yes, don't trust anyone over 30. Heck no, we won't go. So, yeah. If you really want a, an idea, sort of at that time period, outlook... You got to watch Rowan and Martin's Laugh In. Laugh In was like the flower power culture in a TV show. 
It's just nonstop jokes, just just rapid fire. And, uh, you know, go-go girls with flowers painted on it. Uh, Goldie Hawn was one of them. And uh, big, famous people on Rowan and Martin's Laugh. Ooh, hey, wait, topic of a show. Hey, now, Tom. <laughs> Don't, using the old thinker again. Uh Man, it's amazing. I was almost out of topics the other day before this week started. Now I've got, well, i got to mark Altamont off of here, but I've got one, two, three, four, five. Well, next week's all taken care of. Yep. Just that quick, just that simple. Covers quick with no excuses. And, 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 if things couldn't get any better, I've got the moves like Jagger. Uh, let's see. Captain Mauser said show reruns when I was growing up. Laugh in was great. They were showing that on antenna TV or me TV or something. And it's just great to watch really is. I, I imagine there's a documentary about laugh in that's, uh, pretty good. Dazed and confused is a documentary of the late seventies, early eighties says Terry knee. I've never, you want to hear something? I've never seen it. I've never seen dazed and confused. Never. I need to see it, but then again, I was quite active. The late 70s, early 80s, uh, Terry, come on, brother. We're only a couple months apart in age. That was our time. That was our youth, our youth. We were youths at that time. Um, Aku Mugen said, I, re I would recommend a tough crowd, a comedy show. Well, tough crowd, the... We could certainly do an episode on that, and, I, and it's not beyond the realm of impossibility that we might even be able to get one of the people that was on that as a guest. However, to me, the, the, the story of Tough Crowd is tragedy. There was no reason at all for that show to have been taken off the air, and it was a groundbreaking, wonderful show. Uh, really, and, and luckily on YouTube, you can watch tons of the episodes of it, but uh, Tough Crowd being canceled was just an injustice like you've you know, never experienced before. Very interesting, very interesting, but stupid. Yes, the Dirty Old Man and Ruth Buzzy and the Farkle family, the, ficker, the fickle finger of fate. You know, put that in your funkin' wagnalls. Sock it to me. Here come the judge. Uh, they got Richard Nixon saying, sock it to me. They got John Wayne on there. I mean, it was just an amazing show. Amazing show, laughing. <laughs> Terry Neat, less than a month in age. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Fanny Farkle said, anyway. Edith Ann, yes, Edith Ann, Lily Tomlin on Laugh In, Captain Mauser from the Cheap Seats. Yeah, from downtown. I forgot about that. Aku Mugen says you can find almost every episode, however, the audio is not clean occasionally, only in the right ear. Sorry to hear that. Tough Crowd was great. It was great. Pegleg says, nice job, Tom. My parents said that we were heading there from Pennsylvania with me, four, and my two brothers, six and eight, when our van broke down on the way and they couldn't get it fixed in time. Well, lucky for them. Lucky for them. Goldie Hawn's start. Yes. Yes. I think Judy Carn was on that show, who was a girlfriend of Burt Reynolds at the time. You had uh, all sorts of people. Artie Johnson was on there. Uh, let me just see here. Whoops, a daisy. You know, schmutz there on my watch a uh, Rowan and Martin's laugh in, by the way. Not just laugh in, Rowan and Martin's laugh in. Don't kid yourself into thinking it was just laugh in, because it wasn't. It was Rowan and Martin's laugh in. Say goodnight, Dick. Good night, Dick. Chris Abels is agreeing with uh, the tough crowd thing. And, of course, Chris Abels will be starring in his own late-night television program in just about 11 and a half minutes now. The show's called Replayables. And I think you're going to find it something very special on the Levyverse Network. 
Wake the kids, phone the neighbors, replayables will be on. My favorite people in the world. Even when I'm completely frozen on screen. There. Now I'm not frozen anymore. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, Chris Abels. I don't know how many times I have to say it. Shawnee looks to me like the Russian guy in a James Bond movie that works on the computers. You know, I'm in like a Russian hacker, like a third world Russian hacker. I mean, I've I managed to breach the firewall. Don't worry, boss. Um, let me see here. I'm going to be now. People saying hi to Chris Abels because. Chris Abels is one of the many people who is more popular than I am on my own show. And I don't resent anyone for it. Happy Friday. People saying hi. People saying hi. People saying hi. Because we have the most cheerful chat room on the internet. Always cheery. Uh, Chris Abels. FKB. See you in 10 minutes, Chris. The question I ask is about tonight's replayables. Will someone hurl? Then again, that's always the question I have about it. Uh, <laughs> is this laughing search loaded yet? Oh, yeah, here it is. Well, let's see. We had Judy Karn. I remembered that. Uh, R.D. Johnson. Ruth Buzzy, of course. Joanne Worley. Uh, Alan Sues, you guys won't remember him. Of course, Goldie Hawn, Henry Gibson, Gary Owens, Lily Tomlin. There's a lot of famous people on that show for the time. Larry Hovis, who is probably more famous for Liar, Liars Club. Teresa Graves, who later on became uh, Christy Love. Get Christy Love, is that the name of the show? You're busted, sugar. Richard Dawson was on that show. Uh, Patty Deutsch was a, a big one on that show. James Drury. Rob, uh, that's the second version was Robin Williams. Charlie Brill. Anyway, enough of that. Enough of that. Come on. Are, are we going to play this game again? StreamYard? Are we going to? Really? Uh, let's see here. Oh, here we go. Big peg leg. Okay, let's see. If they keep playing my clips, there will be flying bile. I don't like it when bile becomes airborne. That's my least favorite kind of bile. Chris is the only one who drinks. Yeah, but he drinks enough for everybody else. <clears throat> I can always tell if Shawnee's been drinking by how many eyebrows he has left. Mm, mm. I must get every drop. Empty. Doggone it. Uh, let's see here. People saying hi. People saying hi. Reverend Wild Bill says, what did we learn tonight? Well, we learned not to hire the Hells Angels as your security team. <clears throat> we heard, we learned that you shouldn't take methamphetamine and try to storm the stage and then pull a gun in front of the Hells Angels. Uh, we learned that you probably shouldn't throw a concert if you're the second most popular rock band in the world that only has a 39-inch riser off the stage. <clears throat> you know what? They should have just waited and had the concert when it was, you know, a good facility, but whatever. Gil says he's got his bourbon ready, Chris. Got his bourbon ready. Rev, we learned Tom's genius. And I don't know about that. Uh, vodka and Jaeger. Aku's doing vodka and Jaeger. Va Aku, just don't climb any ladders, please. Um, Gilman being given a frosty libation emoticon by uh, Chris Abel. Say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. But, Randy, for tonight, because we talked about laughing, I'll say goodnight, Dick. Say goodnight, Dick. Goodnight, Dick. Hell's Angels aren't choir boys. Yes, Captain Mauser, we did learn that. Uh, Aku says, hire the Hell's Angels, but don't hire the more violent chapter. <laughs> yeah, hire, hire the laid-back chapter of the Hell's Angels. Um, 
Beer and acid do not mix. Yes. Acid before beer, have no fear. Beer before acid, you guys know the whole thing. Uh, say goodnight, Dick. Good night, Dick. God, I love laughing. I'm going to have to watch some laughing. I don't have any laughing. I've got a bunch of hullabaloo here. I don't have any laughing. That's because you could see laugh. I mean, I bet you one of my Tubi or something like that, or Crackle or Plex or Pluto, one of my free st streaming channels will have laugh in nonstop. And the Smothers Brothers, too. Man, the Smothers Brothers was just violently anti establishment. Um, not that I care, really. I mean, I didn't, wasn't even of an age back then, but man, oh man, did they go after people. <clears throat> it got to a point where. I don't think they were trying to entertain anymore. They were just trying to zing them, zing them. And they did. They, they, they zing them. You know. uh, Aku says, no fear of beer here as I can't drink it. Okay. Reverend Wild Bill says, the Hells Angels was just a misunderstood scooter club. Yeah, I noticed a lot of the Hells Angels riding Vespas. Please. PLV says, Tom, have you survived Replayables yet? I've been a guest on Replayables, PLV, I'm proud to say. Yes, I was a guest. They let me sit in the good chair. They said, uh, you know, you're a guest here. but We treat you like family, so if you want something, just go to the fridge, get anything you want. It was the best kind of guesting you could possibly do. The Wolf is here. He says, hello, everyone. Hi, Tom. Hello, Wolf. Um, the Reverend says, sorry, angels. Yeah, d don't bother correcting your spelling. I'll figure it out, Rev. I'll figure it out. Uh, wolf, Aku, homie, don't play that here. Says you were a great guest. That's, uh, You know, you can say Chris Abels doesn't always make the best decisions. You can say that drinking that trash can full of beer every show and blowing into the thing and it's like 0.294. You might say those are not the best decisions to make. However, it's probably good for ratings. And he doesn't have to make any more good decisions because he managed somehow to convince... Homie, don't play that. Tie the knot with them. So, you know, both of them. They've already made the best decision you can make. Those two crazy kids, I think they're going to make a go of it. I do. Uh, let's see here. Who's better, mods or rockers? I, I, I don't think either one of them is better. I, I appreciate the strong points of both. I've seen Quadrophenia. I don't want to get beat up or stabbed or anything. Uh, Akumugan says, hello, Wolf. Uh, I guess they could be angels. They were on the square. Yeah, they could be. Hello, Aku. Evening, Wolf. Hello, Rev. Homie, don't play that. It says, thank you for the kind words. Kind words. Just the facts, man. Just the facts. We got three minutes till replayables. So I probably ought to button up this dog and pony show. Chris must have the strongest liver on the planet. I don't think he has a liver. I think it's just a giant pool filter down there with diatomaceous earth in it. It's just constantly, Aku said, sorry, mixing a drink. Nah, don't worry about it, man. Don't worry about it. Don't be sorry. Don't ever be sorry. Not, not, not about this show, please. I think I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, button up another week here on the Tom Gully Show. I thank you all for being here on a Friday show. I know how painful that can be. Uh, what's, what's this? It's a punch ball now. Good gravy. Not, not a little, just a punch ball. Pool filter. Yeah, it's a, just a pool filter down there. Well, the wolf says, mine's pretty strong. I drank a cage of beer once. A cage or a case? The wolf makes beer that's like 25 proof. He makes some strong beer, but you wouldn't be able to take it. Just don't get me started on the wolf's booze. He also makes real good corn liquor. L-I-K-K-E-R. Aku says, also, fun thing I found on the tube, a history of hip-hop in 60 minutes. It's 50 years of hip, hip history. 
hip hop, hippy, 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 hip, hip hop, you don't stop, rock to the bang, because boogie, 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 boogie. My name is Wonder Mike, and I'm here to say hello to the black, to the white, the green, and the red, the purple, and yellow. But first, I got a, uh, a cage. A cage? Um, never heard of Jaeger with vodka. Gotta try. Uh, let's see here. Rockers, beetle boots, and black leather jackets. Damn right, Lyndon. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, Chris Abels, come on, man. That's too much. That is too generous. Chris Abels, uh, that, I think, might be the biggest super chat I've ever gotten. And Chris Abels, it just, you didn't have to do that. Uh, you really didn't. Uh, but thank you. I appreciate that. That was really nice. Um, I made that cider strong. Sneaky alcohol. Let me get these last three, and then we're getting out of here. Because uh, see you all up in the chat over there. Sugar Hill Gang. Yes, the Sugar Hill Gang. I'm using separate glasses, says Aku, and Chris Abel says, nope, you're the best. I am not the best. I'm not even in the top five. However, we got to get out of here because we got replayables in 20 seconds. So I'm going to play this song. You guys get out of here. Go over to the replayables. I'll join you there in a minute. And uh, with all that being said, there's only one thing left to say, and that is until next Monday. Till next time, we'll see you next time.